Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast for today, which happens to be the fourth day of March in the year of our Lord, 2021. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm your host, Russ McCullough, for Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast, coming to you Tuesday through Friday at 10 a.m., live from historic Mint Hill, North Carolina, on behalf of the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. We are located at 2525 Archdale Drive, and we worship live and in person on the Lord's Day at both 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And if you're able, we invite you to worship with us as we spirit, uh, we worship God in spirit and in truth, gather around the Lord's table to remember him as he has commanded us. And so we are lovingly and happily delighted to do so. And we are studying the book of Acts right now, verse by verse. It is the book of salvation in the New Testament. More information on how one answers the question, what must I do to be saved, is found. In many places in the book of Acts, we hear information on salvation. But first and foremost, and primarily, is Acts 2. And when the Pentecost ends, needed to know what they had to do. Peter replied and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 47 of Acts 2, we understand that those that did so their names were added by the Lord himself to the church. And so it is today. And will remain so until the end of time. And so that is our primary focus here on calling on the name of the Lord. And we get that name, by the way, from Acts 22:16, where we read and understand and comprehend from the Holy Spirit that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is synonymous with calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. Calling on the name of the Lord for salvation and water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins are synonymous terms. They're one and the same. How does one call upon the name of the Lord for salvation? One gets in the water. When one is in the water, the powerful working of God by the circumcision of Jesus Christ separates our sins from us. And we rise to a new life. And we understand that comprehensively from what Paul, the inspired writer, said in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Don't take my word for any of this. Check out the passages. Acts 2, verse 37 through 47. Number 2. Acts 22 and verse 16, and number 3, Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. Uh, good morning, Brett. Glad to, you're here. And so, as we always do, we answer questions from the Scriptures and ask questions from the Scriptures. Yesterday, we had a rather uh, long uh, passage in terms of content, and that was Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 25 through 35, and what we're going to do now is to read that passage, and then we're going to answer the questions that we posed yesterday, we constructed together uh, in yesterday's broadcast, and as the case always is, all the questions and all the answers come straight from the scripture, because the scripture is self-interpreting. It does not need my interpretation or yours. It is self-interpreting. What does that mean? It means what it says 
and says what it means. And it is our goal here on this podcast to neither add to nor take away from God's Word as Jesus enjoins us in Revelation chapter 22. Uh, Good morning, Zanadia. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, Tell me if I I pronounce it incorrectly. Uh, We'll correct it. Good to have you. And so we want to now turn our attention to yesterday's passage uh, because uh, we want to be noble. We want to be noble like the Bereans in Acts 17 11. We want to search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so because the Bible will tell us. Okay, Acts uh, 20, verses 25 to 35. We'll read it, and then we'll answer the questions from yesterday. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus now. He himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Okay, so here are the questions we posed yesterday, and we're pose them right out of the scripture, and we're going to answer them right out of the scripture. The scripture's doing all the asking and all the answering here. We're not injecting any speculation. This is all about revelation. So question number one, who is speaking? Well, if you go back into the context, you can see uh, easily that person, that speaker is Paul the apostle. Question number two, Uh, He has gathered together these Ephesian elders here at Miletus. He says, these Ephesian elders will never see who again. They'll never see Paul again. This is the last meeting they will ever have. A very sad occasion for them all. Uh, Question number three. From what did Paul not shrink from? He did not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God. He did not shrink from any portion of Scripture. He did not avoid any portion of Scripture. He preached and he taught it all. The whole nine yards, as they say. It's interesting how that expression came about in World War II on the B-17 bomber. Uh, There were machine guns to protect the bomber as it made its runs, and the machine gun ammunition was in a cloth binder and each binder was nine yards long and so it came to be said that when the enemy attacked you gave him the whole nine yards so that's where that expression comes from little trivia uh, if you please the whole nine yards he gave him the whole nine yards of the whole council of God Uh, question number four Uh, To whom are these elders to pay careful attention to? These elders are to pay close attention to two parties. Two parties. Number one, themselves. And number two, to the flock, to the congregation over which they've been made overseers. Those are the two parties. Okay. Uh, Question number six. 
what is their primary task? Their primary task is to care for the church of God. That's their primary task. Question number seven. What name of the church is here utilized by Paul? He refers to the church here as the church of God. Question number eight. What other descriptive terms does the New Testament refer when describing the church? The church is called a number of things in Scripture. All of these descriptions are biblical. So among other description terms, the first is very interesting. Obviously, in Acts 2 and verse 47, it's simply the church. We also see that the early church was called the way after the statement of our Lord that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except by him. It was called the way. It was called the church. Uh, Paul refers collectively to the congregations of the, the church in Romans 16, verse 16, as the churches of Christ. Here we see the church of God. Uh, the church is also referred to as the church of the firstborn. And uh, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. So a number of uh, terms are used to describe the church. Excuse me. Sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. I apologize. Okay. So those are some of the other descriptive terms uh, used in the New Testament in referencing the church. Uh, the, the term most often used today is churches of Christ because the church is bought and paid for by Christ. It belongs to him. And so uh, all these other phrases are biblical, uh, but uh, most of us refer to ourselves as the churches of Christ, uh, as Paul does in Romans 16. Question number nine, how did Christ obtain the church? How did Christ obtain the church? Well, he obtained it by his own blood. A heavy, heavy purchase. It was the most expensive transaction ever made in the history of all eternity. The blood of Christ, the blood of God himself, bought the church those who are in the church those who have repented of their sins and have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and have been added to the church by the Lord himself that church made up of sinners Christ purchased with his blood the most expensive transaction in all eternal history don't ever forget how valuable the church is to God. Okay, uh, question number 10. What does Paul know? He knows something, and this may contribute to his tears, if not constitute his tears. He knows these very elders that he himself appointed some of them, some of them, uh, it says, I know in verse 29 that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in where? Among you. Among you, elders. Fierce wolves will come in. He knows this. Question number 11, from where will these devouring false teachers arise? They will arise from their own number. There's false teachers in the group of elders 
that Paul is addressing at Miletus with tears. Now, some of them may not know they're going to become false teachers. But Paul knows it. Because Christ has shown it to him through the Holy Spirit. This is the future. This is the future of the Church of Christ at Ephesus. And we know that this came to pass. Because in the book of Revelation, the very first church that Jesus addresses in Revelation of the seven churches of Asia, the first one is Ephesus, and he says, you have lost your first love. Why did they lose their first love? Because false teachers that have risen among the ranks of the eldership has rendered falsehood among them. Question number 12, they will speak what? They will speak twisted things, as the ESV renders it. Twisted words, twisted scripture, twisted things. That's what these men are going to be speaking as they devour the sheep of the church. And question number 13, what will motivate these devouring false teachers, a following. They're seeking a following. They want to be preeminent. The false teacher will speak twisted things in order to gain a following, an entourage of persons that follow them around and speak highly of them and congratulate them and honor them and do all these obeisance activities. They want to follow him. Uh, question number 14, what did Paul not covet? Well, three things he is, does not covet. He does not want or covet anything whatsoever. He covets, of course, verse 33 says he covets neither their gold, silver, nor their gold, nor their apparel. Now, we might find it a little odd that he would be tempted to cover uh, covet apparel uh, because we have, uh, in our day and time, uh, closets full of clothes. But in ancient times, a typical person would essentially have one set of clothes. And uh, they would wear them literally to threads uh, before they would replace them if they could and so someone who had more than one set of clothes was someone that was coveted by others but Paul didn't covet their silver he didn't cover their gold covet their gold and he didn't covet their apparel Question number 15, why did Paul work? Why did Paul work? Why did he work uh, with Aquila and Priscilla and others in his uh, uh, vocation of tent making? Well, uh, he, uh, uh, these, this, he ministered to his necessities and to those who were with me. He worked to provide for his own necessities and the necessities of others who were with him. He made tents. And Paul, the missionary, we read a lot about him sailing the Mediterranean. But by and large, when he traveled, most of the time was taken up in walking from place to place. And when you walk from place to place, you had to spend the night out in the open. And you can't spend the night in the open, day after day, night after night, without proper shelter. And the only way you could have proper shelter is to have a tent. And the only way you could have a tent is to buy one from a tent maker. Well, Paul didn't sell his tents. He gave them to those with him. Uh, and he illustrates this uh, with something... Uh, that he says from the Lord. Uh, he says, by working this way, by 
working to help others. And by the way, we've mentioned this before, we'll mention it again. Uh, self interest is not selfish. When you take care of yourself, you will be given the ability to take care of others. You can't take care of others if you neglect yourself. So when you take care of yourself responsibly, you are thereby given the ability by God to take care of others. And so this is what Paul says, working hard in this way, we must help who? The weak. Those who do not have what we have. And so this is what Paul's point is, and he illustrates this point, proves this point, by quoting Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said it's better to give than it is to receive. This is the essence of what we just referred to, self-interest. Self-interest. How do I best take care of myself? The way I best take care of myself is by taking care of others. And when I take care of others, I automatically take care of myself. And when I take care of myself, I automatically have given, been given the ability to take care of others. Jesus says self-interest, not selfishness. It is better to give that it is to receive. Amen. Okay. Um, that's question number 16, the words that Paul uh, exclusively reveals to us. And we say that because these words that Paul quotes from Jesus Christ do not appear in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John You'll search all over those four books. You will not find this statement from Christ. It is better to give than it is to receive. How did Paul know that Jesus said this? It was revealed to him. The whole body of experience between the time Jesus was baptized and the time he ascended back to heaven was revealed to him in great detail by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Even though Paul did not experience the ministry of Christ in real time, he wasn't there. He wasn't a Christian. Well, no one was a Christian before Pentecost, but he was not a disciple or an apostle of Christ in real time. Uh, he became one after the fact. And the experiences, however, that all the other apostles had, the knowledge they had of all the things that Jesus Christ said and did during those times. This was revealed miraculously to Paul by Jesus Christ. Now how that happened, when it happened, we don't know. We just know it happened. Paul knew things about Jesus that nobody knew except the other apostles. That's why Paul, being an apostle, can testify to Jesus Christ. Because only an eyewitness can be a testimony giver in a court. You can't go to court and climb the stand as a witness and then tell, well, I wasn't there. How would I know? You can't be a witness if you weren't there. And that is the case with the apostles. They are witnesses to the risen body of Jesus Christ, not just in appearance, but in all aspects uh, that we mentioned, uh, and if you want to know exactly how that worked, read the first three verses of 1 John. John describes the apostolic witness criteria. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Check it out for yourself. Don't take our word for it. Look it up for yourself. Uh, the significance here, question number 17, is the fact that Paul by knowing this, proves his apostolic authority uh, at this time and place that is now recorded by uh, the historian Dr. Luke. Luke is writing all this stuff. He's right there, in fact. He's a witness to what's going, uh, is what's being said. He was, he was right there as Paul 
was speaking, dialoguing with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. And so that's uh, our, our passage from yesterday. All the questions came from the scripture. All the answers came from the scripture. And we'll do it again right now for today's passage, a rather short passage, Acts chapter 20, verses 36 uh, to 38. And we will read this passage. I will make observations about it. Then we will together construct our questions from the scripture to be answered uh, by the scripture, Lord willing, tomorrow at 10 o'clock right here on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast as we always do. So here is the passage uh, from the scriptures. We're reading from the English Standard Version as we always do. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Well, uh, this passage here is instructive in a number of ways, but it's instructive in how we understand and comprehend Scripture because there's a lot of pronouns in this passage, and we want to look and see uh, who they refer to and what they refer to, and this is what we call reading comprehensively with the understanding with the understanding. We understand what is being said. Uh, we don't take things out of context. Uh, we read in context so that we can comprehend what is being said, to whom, uh, for whom, and what the meaning is. Scripture has a singular meaning. There isn't a meaning for them and a meaning for, for us. There's not a meaning for me. There's not a meaning for you. There's Meaning. It says what it means and means what it says. This is what we refer to when we talk about uh, the scripture being self-interpreting. Uh, if we have ears to hear, as Jesus always enjoins us, we can understand what the scripture says if we read it and meditate upon it because language will tell us what it means if we just Focus on what is said. Okay. Uh, and, the word and, that's a transitional word. It's transitioning from a very highly charged emotional dialogue to the next scene, as it were, in the play. And is a transitional word. Um, when you see this in Scripture, this word and in, the word in Scripture... It is a transactional word. It, it means that the writer is tran transitioning from one thing to another. And, and when he had said these things, who's he? He is Paul. These things refer to what? The dialogue he had with the Ephesian elders, uh, which begins in verse uh, 18 and continues through verse 35. That's these things. So he is Paul. These things refer to the dialogue with the Ephesian elders just concluded. So, and when he had said these things, he, Paul, knelt down and prayed with them all. Who is all? All is all the Ephesian elders that were gathered together with him at Miletus to say these final goodbyes. You know, goodbyes are tough, but when there's a final goodbye and everybody knows it, that is really, really tough. When you say goodbye for the last time. I uh, often think about all the Gold Star families. 
who said the last goodbye to their sons and their daughters as they left for whatever war it might have been. And they never came back. That last goodbye before they would leave is just always heart-wrenching. And so is this. Paul knows and they know this is it. We're never going to see our beloved Paul again. And these Ephesian elders are intimately, intimately engaged with this man, Paul. Because as we uh, have studied, uh, Paul, he says, uh, in, uh, uh, let's see, where was it? Uh, uh, He says somewhere in here that he, uh, that he uh, labored with them uh, for three years. I can't put my eyes on it. I apologize. It's in here somewhere. Uh, I don't want to search something without uh, uh, he says he was with them for three years I'll have to uh, note that in the uh, the comment section after Afterwards, I don't want to keep us too long. But he is weeping with them because for three years, these men were intimately involved with him. Uh, the Bible says for two years of that three years, every day, every day, he was at the debate hall of Tyrannus, debating with the Jews and the Greeks regarding the gospel. Every day. And he went house to house every day. So these people had been seeing him for every day for several years. And now, it's it. He's leaving and he's never coming back. We're never going to see him again. The man who's been like a fixture in the Church of Christ at Ephesus for several years is now going to be gone forever. We'll never see him again. How are we going to get along without Paul? But he prayed with them all. All means all the Ephesian elders that were there gathered at Miletus. And there was much weeping on the part of all. all. Paul and all the elders, that's who the word all refers to. Uh, they refers to all the Ephesian elders. They, what did they do? They embraced Paul and kissed him as the custom was. And they were sorrowful. Most of all, they were sorrowful for a whole lot of reasons, but mostly they were sorrowful for the fact that Paul had said, I'm never going to see you again. Um, this is uh, something that we should consider more often than we do. Because there's coming a time when we will have a final conversation with everyone we ever knew. We just don't know when that is. How often have you heard people say at a funeral, I just saw him last week. I just talked to her the other day. Make sure, if you possibly can, every time you have a conversation with anyone, Consider the possibility this might just be the last time you ever speak to this person. So make sure that what you say and how you say it is gracious and kind and loving.
because you may never see them again and they may never see you again. Always leave on a positive note with everyone. Okay. And they accompanied him to the ship. They. Who's they? The Ephesian elders. They took him and Paul's entourage with Luke and whoever else is with him. They walked him down to the to the seashore where the ship was docked. Paul and his company boarded. The Ephesian elders were there crying. And none of these people ever saw any of them again. Paul left knowing that among those elders, wolves would arise speaking twisted things in order to obtain a following. A very, very sad occasion for all those persons. So uh, that's uh, the passage, and now we want to uh, construct our uh, questions that we'll answer uh, tomorrow. All these questions are coming straight from the Scripture. All the answers are coming straight from the Scripture because the Scripture is self-interpreting. It means what it says and says what it means. And we can understand and comprehend. We just pay attention to what's written and how it's written in the context it's written and look at the words that the Holy Spirit has given to assist us in our understanding. This is not rocket scientists. science. Uh, it is... It is not the easiest thing in the world, but it is truth, pure truth. And we can understand it and comprehend it if we just have ears to hear, as Jesus enjoined. So, question, question number one. Who is, quote, he in verse 36? Question number two. To what does, quote, these things, end quote, reference? Question number three. To whom does the word all, in quote, refer in verse 36? Question number four. In verse 37, name three things. They all did. Question number five. What was the main reason for sorrow among the Ephesian? elders. Question number six. What was the final act of this event? 
Okay, so six questions for tomorrow. Uh, questions come straight from the scripture, and the answers tomorrow, Lord willing, will come straight from the scripture. So we'll have a complete understanding of this passage, and then, Lord willing, tomorrow we will begin in chapter 21, and we'll cover the first six verses of chapter 21 tomorrow, if time continues and the Lord wills. Uh, because, just as this case was, this might be our last conversation. Either you or I may not be here tomorrow. And that's a little morbid to consider, but at some point in time, that's going to be the case. There's going to come a time when I will not dialogue with you anymore. And there's going to come a time when you will not dialogue with me anymore. There'll come a time when we will have our last conversation. So that is why we have this podcast, Calling Upon the Name of the Lord. Because I want to make sure that if and when we have our last conversation, that you, dear listener, Know what you must do to be saved. And that is to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission and forgiveness of your sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be added to the church by the Lord himself so you can then remain faithful unto death and become a minister of reconciliation bringing the message of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. We're saved to save others. That's why we're here. And that's why we say these things, because one day we will dialogue no more. And so uh, God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing, on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast. I'm Russ McCullough saying goodbye.